they're relaxing. And so that, in that condition, you could just paddle right up to them and, and harpoon them. But the thing is, you don't want to try to haul a swordfish into your boat when it's thrashing. If you want to, if you want to see what a swordfish is like when it's caught, uh, harpooned, go on YouTube. There are these sword fishermen that harpoon fish today love to put their exploits on YouTube. And you can see just how powerful these fish are. Uh, traditionally, they were hunted from schooners or you know, fishing boats. Uh, if you have a mast, you might as well stick a guy up at the top of it to uh, spot the swordfish. You don't need to do that, but it, you know, it's, it helps. And then you can see out in the end of the bowsprit, the harpooner getting ready to, as they say, iron a fish or dart a fish. Here's a 19th century uh, drawing of that guy. Not that very guy, but harpooner. And he's getting ready to, to iron a swordfish. And here's uh, a modern Nova Scotian named Franklin Dontremont. He's the, he's the high liner up there. And he's getting ready to harpoon a swordfish. That's how they hunt. They also long line them. But um, the environmentally friendly and the prime fish are harpooned. <clears throat> now, so if they're not bringing them into the boats, what are they doing? So I, I searched the literature for other people that hunt, as I say, big dangerous animals that live in the sea. And they all do it in about the same way. They get a big dugout canoe and they uh, make a float. And so the harpoon is attached not to the hunter or the boat, but to the float. So they harpoon the fish, they toss the float overboard, then they just go off and continue their hunt or whatever. And they come back later to retrieve the animal that's either dead or exhausted by that point. These guys are going after either whales or walruses, I'm not sure. They're maca from Washington. And this is an early, about 1900. They're still fishing traditionally then. And those big blobs on the boat, those are inflated seal skins. Now the hunters, back a few slides ago, they use wooden kegs. So I don't know what the red paint people use, but they probably use some kind of a float. Could have been an inflated skin, I, I, we just don't know. It's all organic material and it's gone. We'll probably never know. But I'm pretty sure they're using big dugout canoes Harpoon, we know they're using harpoons with four shafts. We know they're capturing swordfish. So I think their hunting rigs would have looked about like this. <clears throat> now, could we have big dugouts like that? Yes, we could. White pine used to grow to immense sizes. The Bowden pines are toothpicks compared to real mature pine forests. That one's about four feet at the butt. You can make a really big dugout canoe out of one of those. And we know they had the gouges and adzes to do it. Okay, this is, I get a little theoretical. I'm just going to touch on this just, just to let you know that I've racked my brains about trying to understand these people. Does environmental adaptation work for them? No, because the environment, the Gulf of Maine was rich a thousand years before they came along. It stayed rich until recently, after they became extinct 3,800 years ago. So it can't be the environment. I mean, at some level, the environment permitted them to live this extravagant lifestyle. You couldn't do that at Point Barrow, Alaska. You know, and you couldn't do it off the coast of West Africa. The wrong kind of environment. It had a richness that could support this kind of life, but the richness doesn't explain the complex life. So about 20 years ago now, and a smart guy at, at, at Harvard named Lewontin was dealing with the same problem. There are some animals that just do stuff that an adaptation can't explain. And I'll show you a couple of examples. But the most obvious is beavers. Beavers don't adapt to their environment. They build their environment. And this is called, it's come to be called niche construction. Species live in ecological niches. We all know that, right? But the, the prevailing thought until Lewontin was that they adapted to their, to their niche. The niche was there and they filled it. And then Lewontin began to realize, no, they don't just sit there and adapt to the niche. They very often build the niche. So there's this interaction. They're, they're, they're not just passive in the face of their environments. They're actively engaging their environments. So a famous uh, example among humans is the movement of people who, who use dairy, who raise dairy herds up into Europe. Most people in the world can't stand milk after they're weaned from their mother. They're, they just lose the ability to, to digest lactase. But in a society that's raising cattle for meat, hide, and maybe trying to use the milk, there's going to be some variance in that population, and some of those folks will be able to tolerate milk better than others. And they're going to have a big advantage in terms of being fatter, be able to have more kids. And so their kids are going to start replacing pe the, the kids of people who, who can't digest uh, milk beyond weaning. And so what happens is these, these people go on a march up into Europe, and they, they come into their environment, they cut down the trees, they make pastures, and all the time that more and more of them are being able to live 
and use milk longer and longer in their lives. And so they just come up through Europe and they create a, a dairying culture. That's a, niche, that's a case of niche construction. They didn't just wander into those areas, let the cows go in the woods, and continue not to be able to digest milk. So it's, a, it's an instance of a cultural behavior changing the genetics of a population. I'm not saying that these folks had their genes changed, but what I am saying is that what explains their cultural complexity is some social factor. And so in trying to think what that social fact, this, I use this in class. Uh, it's got some diagrams you don't need to bother with. So I began looking around the world, where are swordfish abundant? If there's such a great thing to catch, I expected to find other examples that might help me understand these people. So this, this is in the book and the little triangles that you can see around the world are where swordfish are abundant. So I checked the archaeological record of those places, no one hunted swordfish. So that makes the hunting of swordfish began to focus my interest. Why are they doing that? You know, it's dangerous, it's expensive, they, they could just caught more cod, you know, cod's perfectly delicious food. So why are they hunting swordfish? So I began to, get, to return to my folks who are hunting dangerous things in the sea. Um, down at the bottom right is an umiak. It's an Eskimo kind of boat for whale hunting. They have kayaks, you know about kayaks. They also have these big boats, they're kind of dory shaped. And they're called umiaks. And that guy standing there, he's the captain. He's called, called an umialik. He's the boat captain. And he is a powerful man in the community. Most hunter-gatherers we think of as being egalitarian. All the guys are about the same, all the women are about the same, they all do what their genders do. Maybe there's a shaman, that would be an odd person in the community, different from the others, but we think of them as egalitarian, without social differentiation. But marine hunters of dangerous animals, they are always stratified. There is always a class of highly revered people who are in charge of this, this dangerous activity. And they need cooperation from a crew. They have to be personalities that can win wealth enough to make these boats, and then um, popular enough to attract a crew of loyal, of loyal aides and, and, and fellow hunters. And as one anthropologist said, uh, you know, the, the boat captain is a valuable friend and a dangerous adversary. So on the, these are the two kinds of people I think we're dealing with when we deal with red paint cemeteries. On the upper left is a shaman. And you can, you can tell he has a slightly disoriented, disheveled look. And you know, this is, we might classify this person as you know, uh, emotionally disturbed, mentally ill. Um, and th that's his kit right there. That's his shaman stuff, all this, th these beads and, you know, whatever they need. There's no sort of standard kit. They often do resort to translucent things. Oh, and by the way, those, those, those Ramachur points, th they're another translucent thing. You know, those ones from, I don't think they're, they're not, we don't find those in villages. I think the shamans are gazing into those things. So at any rate, there's a shaman and a boat captain. And I think these are the people who are in the cemeteries. Are the commoners in the cemeteries? I don't think so. I can't prove this, but I began to do some back of the envelope mathematics. The red paint cemetery is unusual in that we know where they all are, or where almost all of them are. I don't think, well, I, I would have said this 15 years ago, there are none left. Well, I found two since then. But that's because I'm looking on the Androscoggin River. No one ever thought to look on the Androscoggin River. They, the, the tradition was they begin on the Kennebec and they go to Mount Desert, roughly, and then there's a couple of outliers farther east. And by the way, that's very unusual. That tightness of territory, it's almost unprecedented for hunter-gatherers in North America. Hunter-gatherers are kind of, you know, they're amoebic. Their, their range is kind of amoebic and irregular, and they feather from a thick center to a indefinitely sparse margin. These guys are tight. They're just tightly clustered. It's as if they are saying, we are us and you are not. Now, I'm going to end with this because this is, this is the remaining mystery with the red paint people. There are a couple of cemeteries up north. One is that one at um, the Curtis site. This, this is the Twilling Gate, one where those, we had, that had the gouges that looked just like the ones from Maine. And the other one's at port on the other on the west coast of Newfoundland on the North Peninsula, a massive cemetery. Um, I should go to this, just to give you the size of the scale. There, there's the locations of those two sites. I'm going to take my slides out of order if you let me. This is the big, big uh, uh, town of, uh, fishing town of port Newfoundland. And it, the, the cemetery there is so unlike main cemeteries. It runs this entire distance through town. There's untold hundreds of burials in there. We've only excavated a few, but anywhere in town, I visited it oh, 10, 15 years ago, anywhere 
I was there the day after your father, Dick. Um, just missed him. We were chasing each other north. So uh, anyway, I was talking to folks in town. Every, anywhere a backhoe gets working there, they come up with these incredible artifacts. So it's one massive cemetery. So now let me get back to my basic point. All right, there are familial relation, resemblances. There are red ochre burials in Maine. There are red ochre burials at port There are gouges and adzes, and, but they're different styles. They're the same functional categories, but they're different. But in some couple of instances, there are exact parallels. This bayonet is one of those strange uh, bayonets with a ridge on one side, uh, smooth on the other, made of banded slate from Ohio. So those folks too are somehow reaching out to the Eastern Great Lakes area and pulling a few of these artifacts in for reuse in their rituals. But the most amazing are, if you look at these harpoons, these are as general forms the typical harpoons, barbed harpoons. But there's a little feature on these. There's a little secondary barb. You can't really see it too well. There's one here. Okay, these are from port These are from that one site that one red paint cemetery that we had bone preservation from, it's up at Blue Hill Falls. It's called the Nevin site. They have that same strange little secondary barb. That is just spooky. It's just so incredibly similar between these two areas. These similarities caused Jim Tuck, who originally found that Newfoundland cemetery, to say it's all the same culture. And we just haven't, we can't link this, this site in Newfoundland to Maine yet because we haven't surveyed, you know, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. We said that 40 years ago. It's been surveyed. There are no cemeteries between Maine and port So there's some sort of another weird northern connection. And I just don't know what it means. In the book, I say, here's a Hail Mary pass. It could be that we think that the latest red paint cemetery is that one at Cow Point up in New Brunswick. And I said, you know, maybe these folks are pulling out of this region. Maybe they're heading north. And by the time they got there, they, refrained, they retained a few connections to the south, a few specific traits that make them look like the southerners, like red paint barrels and those secondary barbs. But, but maybe their cultures had changed. But I, I don't hardly believe that myself. Uh, it's, it's a possibility, but it's a just-so story. Okay, so the red paint time span, also very discreet. About 4,500 to 38. At 38, they blink out like a busted light bulb. They're just gone. There's no trace of them. And a new culture sweeps into the region. And it's like a wave, like a tsunami of southern Appalachian people sweep into the region and just sort of like bump up against the south shore of the St. Lawrence River. And then they occupy it for a while. Then they begin to retreat. And they, make a complete, they leave a completely different archaeological record. They made pots out of stone, soapstone. Steatite, very soft, you know, these old sinks that you see in old houses? That's steatite. Expensive European wood stoves have steatite. It's very dense, and it holds heat beautifully, but it's easy to carve. So they had need of some sort of a vessel that would hold liquid and retain heat very well, and they hadn't um, invented pottery yet, so they made them out of soapstone. And then they made this very unusual style of projectile point. It's totally different from, um, from the red paint people Projectile points, and they're very provincial. They, they're not, these folks don't reach out long distances. They may have come from a long distance, but once they enter this region, they're very provincial in all their artifacts and all the, the raw material use. They did get a bit of native copper once in a while from out in the Great Lakes area, but that's, that's all. So that is the sudden end of one of the most amazing archaeological cultures in North America, and I have no explanation for what happened to it. The environment goes cruising along. I'm sure the swordfish were still around, but no culture ever hunted swordfish again. No culture ever again resembled the red paint people. Even after these people left, these, these modern, these more recent immigrants, they came to Maine, stayed a century or two maybe, and then they left. And did the red paint people come back? No, there's, there's really a void in the prehistoric record for several centuries. It's almost as if almost no one lived here. And then eventually the, the record, the ceramic period begins. The archaeological record comes alive again, and people are making pottery and living completely different lifestyles from the red paint people. So that's, that's a, a brief summary of the red paint people and my lifelong attempt to understand them, get my mind around them. What, what my colleagues have done is always try to use adaptation to explain them, and it just didn't work. And they also tried to link them to a broader pattern. 
there's competition between two models. There's a culture out in the, to the north and west, it's called Laurentian tradition. And a lot of archeologists say, oh, they're really part of the Laurentian tradition. I think it gave them a sense that if you could only link them to something larger, they're like a nail, you could hammer them down that way and make them seem more normal. And then the, another group of people realize that, you know, there's a, there's a string of different kind of cultures go down the Atlantic coast. They make stem points instead of big ones, big broad ones. And so you know, I'm in this camp, I think they did descend from the small standpoint people, as we so gracefully call them, elegantly call them. Um, but th that doesn't explain, neither, neither model explains the sudden efflorescence of these people. And I think it was based on the fact that social entrepreneurs in the culture and perhaps shamans put together this, this way of gaining prestige and power for themselves. And they manifest it... Uh, probably in life by being boat captains or religious practitioners. And here's a point I forgot to make about the cemeteries. When you add up all of the burials in the cemeteries, I remember I lost that train of thought, we do know where the cemeteries are. We do know roughly how many people were buried in the cemeteries, right? And it's not nearly enough people to account for the population that must have been here. I would say about a tenth of the overall population is represented over the few centuries. And so that means that not everybody was getting buried in a red paint cemetery. So that leaves the question, who's getting buried in a red paint cemetery? And you look at the artifacts that come out of the burials, you know, these, these translucent uh, materials, these gorgeous artifacts. Um, I think it's two classes of people, shamans and, and boat captains, and they could be the same. In some cultures, they could function, in the, you know, the two could be joined in one person. And maybe they're families. And what I would like to do now, if I ever get the chance, is to, is to study the outline, the, the, the arrangement, the detailed arrangement of burials and burial goods in a cemetery. Are they richest at the center? And do they get weaker and less rich at the periphery? That would be indicative, I think, of important people being buried at the center and maybe their relatives being buried around them. But the records of detailed structure red paint cemeteries are often in, in a very raw state, if the data exist at all because they were, they were excavated early on in archaeology when people didn't really know how to excavate properly. Neither did they have institutional support to curate the resulting collections properly. So it's, it's really going to be a tough story to, to, to tell or different, difficult problem to crack because the data are just so hard to get hold of. It took me 40 years just to get this far. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's my spiel. I'd be happy. I have some books if anyone... Oh, yeah, I just wanted to point out last slide. The red, the, this, the immigrants, the southerners, we call them the Susquehanna tradition, they brought a new type of woodworking tool, the axe. The red paint people never used axes. No one before them ever used axes. The axe is a southern tool. And when does it show up in Maine? When these immigrants come up. They have the grooved axe, and this is probably roughly what it, it looked like. Someone, someone brought in a natural stone and showed it to me and said, is this a grooved axe? I said, it sure looks like one, but it's really not an axe shape. Some natural stones do develop these grooves because they're made of different kinds of stone, and one kind of stone weathers away faster. So these kind of grooved stones are really more common than you'd realize, just natural forms. But at any rate, that's a grooved axe of the southern style brought in by these, we call them the Susquehanna tradition. Okay, so that's it, and I'd be happy to answer questions. And I'd be happy to sell and sign books later if you'd like. So. The, the, the red ochre, where does it get mined in Maine? Okay. Another thing I forgot to mention. We don't have red ochre in Maine. Where do we have red ochre? Northern Labrador and Quebec. Yeah. 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 So more and more arrows point north. And one arrow points west, or two arrows point west. So then they use boats. They, they must have. You, you need a boat to hunt swordfish. You need a boat to catch cod. Now, uh, um, you need that, a boat to move heavy loads. That well, distance. yeah. A friend of mine just wrote a paper called "Going by Boat," pointing out just how much of an advantage coastal people have in moving lots of stuff mm -hmm. compared to terrestrial people. Exactly, because you can really load a boat up. I have a valued colleague who insists that these people are using nothing but birch bark canoes. We don't have a boat of either type, so who knows, but I don't want to go swordfish hunting in a birch bark canoe. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? How far inland have the red paint graves been found? Um, let's think of the big, the big rivers uh, to Waterville, mm -hmm. Oakland, to um, Pasadumkeg on the Penobscot. That's really not very far. If you look at the full courses of those rivers, it's really not that far above head of tide, actually. 
I mean, you know, the dams are out now, so we know that 